What does it mean to, to live a good life? And then let's figure out how to order our lives now. You have to actually feel and think about others in the correct way. And that has to be something that makes a difference in your life. Yo, what up? Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who study philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we can bullshit with impunity. I am Austin Hayden Smith. And I'm Troy Polidori. And this week we have a guest on, uh, Kendall Gilfillan, who is uh, an expert on Aristotle and ancient philosophy, who is going to talk with us about Aristotle's conception of human dignity, and we're going to get into all kinds of other issues about contemporary philosophy and the practicality of philosophy for everyday life, and maybe some problems with academic philosophy, and the conversation starts talking about social justice and global justice and all kinds of other things. So stick around for that. Not exactly with us, because I got sick and missed it, but I am very excited to hear uh, the discussion between the two of you. I know, it was such a, literally, dude, right when we were about to start the chat, uh, Troy was like, I'm not feeling so good, homie, I gotta lay down, and we couldn't reschedule in that moment at that time, because she had, you know, scheduled a time for her room where she could go and get into a quiet place, and we'd already rescheduled a couple times, so it was kind of like, ah, we gotta just do it, but um, it was a good chat, so this will be kind of like you listening. No, matter of fact, I was gonna be nice, I changed my mind mid-thought. You know, have you ever seen the movie Hudsucker Proxy? I mean, have I ever seen a Coen Brothers movie? Who do you think you're talking okay. to? Yeah, okay, good point. You know the bit when he's in the mailroom at the beginning and the advisor is like, if you don't do your time card, we dock you. And if you don't do it this way, we dock you. And if it isn't this, we dock you. You know what, Troy? You missed the main segment. We're going to dock you. I don't know how we're going to dock you, but I just watched the movie this past week. That's why it came into my mind. <laughs> Are you guys doing a Coen Brothers episode on uh, Wisecrack? No, we did it on I Dig This Movie. Tro- oh, okay. uh, Kira and I watched uh, The Hudsucker Proxy. Oh, no, I'm excited we, uh, for that then. Yeah, yeah, it'll be coming out in the next couple of days here. So, As we've mentioned on previous episodes, if you go on to iTunes and give us a five-star rating and review, and you want to ask us a question in your review, we'll go ahead and read that and name you on air, and then try to answer the question in a couple of minutes if possible. Uh, we got a new review. It doesn't have a question in it, but I thought it was kind of hilarious, so I thought I'd read it on air anyway and get your reaction, Austin. Uh, okay. This is from Professor Basante, which I think is either a surname or it's Bison, in Italian. Um, <laughs> the review is titled, Is Like Nachos for Though, which is kind of great. It sounds like, a, like an avant-garde piece. Um, the review is weird how these South California guys keep balance between an entertained conversation that feels casual and down to earth while talking some pompous subjects such as political theory. Damn good podcast. That's right. <laughs> Damn good podcast with guys from South California. That might be a translation thing, but I kind of like the idea of South California. It sounds, it sounds more like exotic, doesn't it? Yeah. Why do we always say Southern California and not South California? You I know, know, right? It's weird. Like, what well, I'm trying to think, but I get, what is the difference, like, in usage, what is the difference between them? I mean, because you wouldn't say, I'm from South Italy, you'd say, I'm from Southern Italy, right? Yeah. Is it the adjectival version is Southern when you're, but South is also an adjective, Yeah, right? they're both adjectival uses. I, I wonder if there's some sense in which Southern just refers to to actually, like, the South parts, even if it's not split into two, right? Whereas South means sort of like the bottom half. Yeah. And you know what? We always put the definite art, well, not always, but it seems like we often put the definite article when you would say it'd be like the South of California, right? So I've Southern is short. F- oh, I know. But I mean like, but you'd say the South of the United States or you say Southern, okay, yeah. right? Yeah. So maybe it Southern is short for the South of. So it's maybe. a genitive as well. I'm going to start saying South California. Just to get people's okay. reactions. And then in, when they get perturbed, I'm going to ask them, you know, for like some semantic clarification. South California. Yeah. And, but it's not even really that. It's Southwest. Well, yeah, if you want to get down to it. Because what, are we neglecting people from Hemet? Do they not count? I mean, I think they're used to being neglected. <laughs> not because of any reason intrinsic to them, but, you know, geopolitical uh, reasons. Yeah, that's true. 
Well, sweet. Well, thanks for the review, dude. Mr. Dr. Professor Basante. Professor Basante. Professor Basante. Cool. Appreciate that. Uh, also, guys, if you are capable and if you find value in what it is that we're producing, please go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn and throw a couple bucks our way. It um, it helps us to be able to pay for people, hopefully, that can edit the podcast other than me just having to do it. And then also maybe for upgrades in um, new microphones and shit like that. And eventually I got to get a new fucking computer, man. My computer is dying rapidly and I'm Every day, I literally pray before I press the power button. That it's I mean, rapidly, but I feel like it's been dying for about two years. <laughs> that's true, but like, that's true. It has been slowly dying. It's rapidly slowly dying. Um, it's consistently rapidly slowly dying. Um, but uh, yeah, we got a five dollar tier. We can get access to bonus episodes and get on the newsletter that comes out once a month. And then, and then we got a two dollar tier that gets you access to the newsletter, or I'm sorry, that gets you access to the ability to recommend episodes for future topics. And this week, actually, we're going to be uh, taking suggestions for uh, what would be an episode that you guys would want us to discuss, or a topic, I mean, that you guys would want us to discuss in a future episode. So uh, for current patrons, make sure to look out for your emails uh, about that. And then for people who might want to get involved in that, run it over patreon.com slash owls at dawn. Yeah, yeah. But sweet, now we got to start off the uh, podcast the way we start off every episode. It is with the Shitty Minute, where one of us gets to rant and rave about whatever it is that's chapping our hide. This week, it's Troy's turn. What's got you down, man? All right, so I mentioned this on, on Twitter maybe a week or two ago, but this whole thing about Beto being the punk president oh, gosh, is yeah. really grinding my gears. I thought so we weren't going to so- talk about the Democratic nomination, or I said I wasn't. Okay. I mean, I don't really want to, but this was basically served up like a like a batting practice pitch for me. So I'd almost feel like I'm doing a disservice to the world if I don't rant about this. I actually don't even mm. care enough to really rant, but I feel like I that's a duty, like a like a moral duty I have to the universe. You're like Zion Williamson, who is playing against a, a small, short, little white boy who thinks he's going to get a, a three, and he's got about ten feet. And he thinks he's got the room to make the shot. And Zion is like, motherfucker, I am going to run and jump and smack that ball into the seats. Yeah, the thing is, I think Zion gets like pure joy out of doing that. Imagine he blocks the shot from the top of the key. And then he's running down the floor in transition all by himself. And he's thinking, do I just dunk this ball or do I do a 360, reverse 360 behind the back, Tom Hawk? Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, I mean, I've done that so many times. It doesn't necessarily bring me pure joy to do that extra a crazy dunk, but I kind of owe the people watching this <laughs> since they're anticipating something glorious. I kind of have to do it. So he just, right. you know, does some fucking miracle in the air like that so that yep. everyone goes crazy. Like that's, that's what I feel like right now in this shitty minute. So okay. to proceed with the, with the Tomahawk, I think I okay. built this up too much, but um, uh-huh. there's been a couple of articles in the past couple of weeks referencing statements that Beto has made, not necessarily recently, but within the last couple of years, especially in his run up to the senatorial um, election against Cruz last year, mentioning his past in sort of the 90s punk rock scene. Uh, he famously, I think, played in a band with Cedric Bixler Zavala from the Mars Volta and at the Drive In, um, one, two of my all time favorite bands. Um, there was one article in Reuters that said something like Betanomics would have a certain punk rock edge. There was another one I saw in, from The Ringer. Say uh, the title is "America Ready for a Fugazi President," and the the general thrust of these articles, and they're pretty superficial. Um, I mean, given the source, that's to be expected. By source, right. I don't mean the Ringer and writers. I mean Beto. <laughs> um, hmm. Is that he's cool and hip and DIY, whatever that means, and so his campaign is going to be as such. And if he's president, his uh, presidential term will be as such, whatever that means. Getting into the actual specifics is usually like never actually done. The end of the article usually says, I guess we'll have to see what that actually looks like in practice, which means you're kind of asking why is this article being written in the first place? It's basically just clickbait at that point. Um, mm. But my, my big gripe with this isn't necessarily the articles. Yeah, people got jobs. They got to write some stuff. Putting Fugazi in you know, presidential election in the same title makes it sound cool. Um, Fugazi is one of my favorite bands of all time, um, and it is it perturbs me at a deep spiritual level to have them used in a clickbait way like this. And that may mm. come off as kind of a, like a 
like a dogmatic, um, you know, like like a defense of some um, dogma, basically, and that is kind of offensive. I understand that, but I feel like this needs to be said because probably not as many people today like or love Fugazi in the same way that I do. They've sort of disappeared from the scene. Uh, obviously, they've influenced basically every punk and rock band um, since they disbanded in 2001. Um, but they were so antithetical to the corporate scene in music um, and certainly aren't going to be or wouldn't have been uh, very involved in things like Spotify and streaming and stuff like that, that mm. uh, even if they had been around, I don't think they would have necessarily had the same effect now that they had in the 90s. Um, but I just want to compare two things for you uh, to see if this this analogy between uh, Beto and Fugazi it makes a lot of sense. Here's a tweet from presidential hopeful Beto O'Rourke. Let us be clear. We will not be defined by our fears or the smallness of our differences. We will instead be known by our ambitions, our aspirations, and the resolve, the creativity, the service, and sacrifice by which we will have achieved them. I, I don't know what that means at all. And it's especially funny that it comes after the sort of prologue right there, let us be clear. And then nothing <laughs> following that is clear at all. It's all just vague <laughs> banalities. Compare right. that to just a random, this is a rant, right? So this doesn't have to be necessarily like a logical um, refutation here. I'm ranting, so it just has to be like effective, right? This is mm -hmm. Ian Mackay from Fugazi. War is incorrect and bad, and patriotism is a loathsome quality. Because to be a patriot means you have to support the kind of ugliness and violence that is being encouraged all over the world at this moment. Please count me an unpatriot forever. I just Damn. like the first sentence. War is incorrect and bad. <laughs> I mean, you can't really get more clear than that. Yeah, it's morally wrong and it's uh, like scientifically invalid. <laughs> <laughs> it's incorrect and it's bad. Yeah, that's <laughs> what being clear is about. So this whole... Um, Bugazi, uh, excuse me, Fugazi compared to Beto thing. Um, it's really Bugazi. Oh no! Yeah, they're gonna do the portmanteau now. With Bugazi. That's what they're gonna do. They're gonna call him the Bate Bugazi. Gazi. <laughs> you know how Clinton and Obama, uh, both Clinton and Obama, sort of would have these sort of town hall little thing part of their campaign where they go and they talk to people usually in rural areas in the Midwest from the South, and they start talking about their religion. And their their Christianity and the specific people in their yeah. lives that have most influenced them who were religious leaders. Uh, mm -hmm. Obama did this, lot, did this a lot even before he was really running. He had a famous speech that I think I um, like 2004 when he did the like the Democratic National Convention speech. He talked a lot about uh, how Christianity had influenced his sort of his moral compass and how that was led him into politics in the first place. I remember it was the first time I ever heard his name and listened to him talk, and it was. Quite the speech. I haven't heard it in a long time, but I, I vividly remember listening to it. Um, mm. And that was probably more effective than a lot of people in the Democratic Party use religion. But it seems like you can't do that so much anymore, right? So it seems like Beto is using Fugazi as his religion, his way to like to connect with people and be like a, a human person because he enjoys this underground music. Do, do mm. you see that analogy? Do you think that's that's valid? Yeah, you know, it's funny, before you even made your point, I was kind of trying to think, like, what's going on here? It seems like because there's such a skepticism to maybe religion or skepticism to, um, like, typical political language even, I've been listening to a lot and watching a lot of documentaries around, like, the New Deal and uh, FDR and around that time period, and then even, like, the just the interwar period in general, and uh, so, you know, I listened to a lot of speeches from the various presidents at the time, and they were so fucking clear and very clear about policy, very clear about politics, very clear about, like, other people that they were opposing. And it's just kind of strange. Like, you kind of hear Trump in some ways talking about these things, but it's just, again, it's so vague and it's so convoluted and twisted. Like, the other day when he made his comment about the animals that they're deporting, it's, like, so unclear that, like... He did he mean th these people who are criminals in the literal sense that, or is it just like is he generalizing and it's everybody and he's just not articulate enough to make that distinction, or is he intentionally dog whistling? Like, there's just so much. There's a, there's a, I don't know if it's an intentional lack of clarity or if he's just not very intelligent. So it's kind of hard to even use him as 
a, a like a, a benchmark or anything like that, or even as any kind of standard from which, but because he kind of does that. But most of the other politicians, they're just vagaries. And it's like pop psychology vagaries, right? It's like they're trying to find some sort of, I guess we would call it a transcendental signified or something like that. Um, or a transcendental signifier, but but I don't know what it is, you know? So maybe you're right. It's like, I don't know. Yeah, there's one thing that seems to have changed a bit now compared to um, maybe when Obama was first running, you know, 10 years ago or so. Um, it seems like you could really cause like an effective tornado um, around this kind of language and really stir people up and get them um, united together uh, for a common purpose, that being electing Barack Obama. And a lot of that had to do with, you know, Obama was just incredibly charismatic in a way that, you know, no one else in the field is going to probably match. But all the politicians in the Democratic Party who seem to be trying to play that same note, Beto and Kamala and others, it really seems to come off hollow for most people in a way that's, I think, pretty good. Uh, and at least portends good things, I hope, because if one thing Trump has done, he's shown that talking about specific things, even if those specific things are not well formed and are really stupid and don't actually solve any problems for anybody, yeah, is the thing that gets people riled up. The wall was a very specific policy goal, right? Right. I mean, it's stupid, but it's specific. It's not this bullshit like the ambition and the service and the sacrifice that we're going to achieve things. Right, yeah. which is incredibly vague and not specific at all. So it seems like people just are not going to buy that bullshit anymore. They'll buy other kinds of bullshit, like stupid stuff that doesn't actually affect anything or make anybody's lives better. Um, but they're not going to want specific things. Hopefully, I mean, maybe mm. this is just the, the Twitter sphere and the uh, the group think here, but um, it seems like people are a little bit sick of that stuff and see it as very inauthentic in a way that maybe we didn't, even in the midst of the financial crisis in two thousand eight. I mean, because Obama keep you know, was was kind of propelled to the top because of his vagaries, right? Hope and change. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's like if you can use that kind of commercial sloganeering in that context, but I don't know. Is it going to work? I'm I'm not sure. It's strange because it's very. I I, I intentionally use the word pop psychology because that's kind of how it feels. It feels like corporate sloganeering and obviously people will be like oh but there are speech writers and there are like pr people behind these campaigns that are intentionally crafting uh these types of commercialized slogans and language in order to appeal to people based on psychological research and stuff like that like it's very intentional in a lot of ways that these words are being crafted the way that they are i mean there's also a measure of skill that an orator has to have to translate what the pr people are saying so that it can be something you know where it's like what did he say the whatever the fuck the are the smallness of our differences like like shit like that like is that i don't know if that's word for word crafted by some sort of marketer or something like that but but the point is is that you know the idea is that these are the points that we need to make and these are the ways that we need to frame them those things are very much constructed by teams by strategists and so i'm curious if it if it is going to fall flat or if it's going to resonate a little bit more because if you think about it Again, small Twitter sphere, online sphere, the people in my world that are being talked about, uh, and the, 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 the nominees in a way, are Yang Gang, and what is it? He's like, single issue is like the only thing that people care about with him. UBI, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so, in every interview I've ever seen, immediately it's, okay, so tell us about this UBI. How's this going to work? How are you going to pay for it? What's it going to look like? Da -da 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 -da. So, he's got that single issue thing. Bernie, who's like, Medicare for all, you know, uh, Demo democratic socialist kind of policies seems very clear. But other than that, I'm kind of like, you know, Buttigieg is getting a lot of kind of love because of his identity stuff, because he's gay. Um, but he kind of has that, you know, he's like the smooth talking, charming, isn't he a Harvard boy who was also a military vet kind of thing. So, but he doesn't really seem to be talking about like policy. Um, obviously, Kamala and Corey, they aren't as well. I mean, so it, it is kind of interesting. I'm curious to see how this is going to play out and what's going to resonate with the people, so to speak, the broader people. Yeah, and I want to be clear, um, just like Beto was clear. Um, you can use vagaries effectively in certain contexts. So yeah. one of the clearly successful vagaries is make America great again. 
that was an incredibly well crafted uh, in terms of being effective uh, right. slogans. It got people effectively riled up, and it became a slogan for a, a huge swath of the population, right? Um, because of the context in which it's uttered, right? It means a lot more than the the vague uh, phrase itself actually tells you on the surface. In the same way, think about like Martin Luther King, right? Let's not be judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. That's super vague. But in the context of a black guy who's leading marches, denouncing the Vietnam War, denouncing capitalism, um, and then many of his compatriots and himself eventually being killed, that means a lot more in that context than it does at the surface level. When you ask someone, what does Beto mean by this stuff? I, I have no idea what he means by the smallness of our differences and instead be, care about our ambition and our service and our sacrifice. Like, What did the hell those things refer to? Nobody knows because there isn't context to imbue those things with meaning. And that's really the key about when slogans can be effective and when they can't. <laughs> this reminds me of your shitty minute a few weeks ago when you got mad about that billboard that was super vague. What, is, what did the billboard say by your house, remember? Can we talk what, are you, what are you referencing? <laughs> you had a shitty minute where there was like a billboard and you were like, what the fuck is this vague stuff? Like this doesn't make any sense. Maybe it wasn't a shitty minute, but we talked about it. Oh, I don't remember. Um, See, I, I do shitty minutes so I can then expunge them from my mind and never think about them again. Oh, that's good. I'm sorry for bringing this back. The return of the, <laughs> return of the repressed. Um, but yeah, it was like some vague thing and you were like, it doesn't even make any sense. And then we talked about how, but it's nice because it's almost like this little empty signifier and you can fill in anything you want based on where you're currently at in your life, right? So yeah, if you hear- companies do. Enjoy. Exactly. Just do it. Shit like right. that. Drink. <laughs> be ambitious. Okay, you're right. I am going to be ambitious. Thank God it's Monday. I'm ambitious. I'm doing my thing. I'm going to go and be a sociopath what? A lot of people are, exploit are ambitious my workers. about getting rid of immigrants. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, they have resolve and they have aspirations that are very different than yours and mine. That's right. Resolve, ambition, <laughs> effort. The, the presidential campaign for Troy Polidori 2028. Oh my God, shoot me in the face. <laughs> no, but really, it is going to be, I'm, I'm curious to see, because I do, I do get the feeling the more I consider it. I know that I, I mentioned that like Podesta and, and his cronies were saying that they think that like, uh, that Beto is going to be the guy that gets the support and they're going to, if they push the efforts behind him, that somehow that's going to catch fire in the populace. And it could. Who knows, right? I have no friggin' clue. But um, but I kind of feel like that might be too... That, that's just showing that maybe Podesta doesn't get America right now. You know? That's, again, centrist Dems trying to put forward some sort of stale candidate. Because they just don't... They can't read the room. And I'm well, curious... maybe they can't read the room, but maybe also they'd rather lose than lose the control of the party. That's also possible. Ooh, that's a very, very good point. All right, sick. So now we are going to jump into our main segment, and I do have a little bit of sad news for people listening. We were supposed to set up to record with myself and our guest and Troy per normal, but Troy just got a little bit not feeling so well. So he's going to have to take a little step back for the main segment here, but don't worry, he's coming back for the sticky leaves. Um, and of course, you just heard the shitty minute, so he's here. But that's why you won't hear his lovely uh, baritone holding me in line and making things a little bit more simplified uh, during the main segment. But thankfully, we have a guest who will do that. I'm joined by Kendall. Is it Gilfillan? Yep. Well done. Okay. And uh, Kendall is, I mean, I would say you're kind of like an aspiring popular philosophy blogger, influencer type. I have a feeling that that's something <laughs> at least that would be uh, in your horizon. Does that sound about right? Yeah, we'll go with that. Okay, because um, you have written some popular blogs and you post lots of quotes on Instagram that are philosophically inclined and <laughs> news and things like that. Um, I remember you posted something about uh, like the repeal, the eight movement in Ireland. And um, yeah. so you're very interested in social justice issues as well, uh, if that sounds about right. So you're. Yes, absolutely. Correct. Okay. Cool. So, I mean, just for people that are listening, how did you find philosophy and what is your kind of area that you're interested in in philosophy? So when I was an undergrad student in Texas in the States, I was actually majoring in religion and history at the time. Um, and I really, I ended up completing my degree in religion as well. But I, throughout the course of my studies, I 
somehow, I think it was through taking a philosophy of religion course for my religion degree, I encountered philosophy for the first time because really in the States, you're not introduced to philosophy in high school, at least in the public school system. Shit, you could go through college without doing it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not ideal for philosophical education, that is for sure. No, it's definitely not. So, <laughs> yeah, besides reading maybe The Cave <laughs> in like an English class in high school, I really hadn't formally engaged with philosophy but once I did, I fell in love with it, and I ended up dropping my history major, adding philosophy, and really that became my primary focus. So um, from there, I studied as a visiting student at Oxford, studying philosophy and classics, finished undergrad, and moved back to the UK and got my MPhil stud in ancient philosophy from King's College London. Now, um, I mean, just cards on the table, ancient philosophy is not my specialty. I'm much more post-Kantian, continental European would be my area, I guess, of expertise mm -hmm. with philosophy. But of course, you do study things. Unfortunately, a lot of times it's studying things through other people. And so I'm always curious because when I read the ancients and when I read pre-Socratics in particular, I'm always like, God, I wish I would have spent more time or I wish I would take more time on these figures. What was it that yeah. drew you to ancient philosophy? Um... Really, at first, it wasn't even the content, if I'm being honest. It was because really? I was already taking ancient Greek language courses for my religion degree. Ah, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> so I kind of just nerded out and loved being able to go back and translate Aristotle. I remember being in the introductory course, <laughs> and I kind of asked if I could just do, on my five-page paper, I asked my professor, who ended up being kind of my main advisor throughout my undergrad career if I could work with him translating for my paper and he kind of looked at me like what are you on about you know this is a five-page introductory course paper why are you wanting to translate from the original text mm. um but it really just kind of started my love for it um and I think I've always like I said I was studying history um before I dropped that major mm. and so I have really always loved the history of thought and the development of thought. Um, and so for me, it was kind of excavating what what the ancient Greeks actually thought um, and kind of how, how it can relate to us today and how um, it's had such an impact on Western thought. Mm. Um, yeah, kind of Tro Troy and I, we both found philosophy through theology and yeah. <laughs> and I was wondering if you did as well yeah. especially because I feel like uh, so I did my master's degree in philosophical theology and in that as kind of like a stepping stone to uh, further research in just straight philosophy because it was like the undergrad in theology then philosophical theology and then kind of moving on from there right um but it, it seems that in theology circles they are much more inclined, generally speaking, to embrace, you know, Aristotelian virtues and to to consider the idea of Platonic forms because it is a, a sort of transition or there's a bridge. And then, of course, there's a historical connection in uh, influence. But, I mean, as, as far as, like, contemporary Christian thinkers today, they seem much more willing to engage with ancient philosophy than, say, like, <laughs> I don't know, Jean-Paul Sartre, who's, like, a yeah. fucking radical atheist, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so um that 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 seems kind of is that kind of what led the bridge to ancient philosophy for you was it religion into philosophy yeah maybe um i don't think that i've ever consciously acknowledged that as being perhaps a factor but yeah spelling it out like that i think probably that was an influencing factor into why i was kind of drawn mm. to that field mm. i also think that just um, and philosophy, ancient philosophy tends to be one of the fields that's kind of more accepting of women scholars, I found. Interesting. Um, so that probably was also a factor subconsciously. <laughs> really? Are there, I mean, because I know of like feminist reinterpretations of ancient scholarship, like, mm -hmm. you know, Kristeva and Erika Ir Ray and stuff like that are interested in doing that. But, um, that seems to come out of the continental tradition. And I feel like the continental tradition 
is extremely favorable to women. Are you primarily speaking in terms of like analytic philosophy, you think? Like Anglo-American yeah, philosophy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it is, a, it is a fucking boys club, isn't it? Oh, yeah. White boys club. <laughs> a white boys club. It is. It is. I mean, it, it's hard for me because I've been so inundated with the, I guess, the post-Kantian European, post European school of thought, the quote-unquote continental school, and and it's heavily influenced by the the women that have partaken, but they are mostly white women. It's mostly like French women, and then a couple yeah. German women, right? But it's mostly <laughs> white women, and it's only been more recently, it seems, in the last like since the eighties, nineties, and then really in the last fifteen, twenty years, where there's been a concerted effort to um, step back and to allow for minority voices to come to the fore, which. Um, has been really interesting. And this is another angle that I guess you're passionate about is a sort of like uh, a global feminism that also attaches to your reading of ancient philosophy. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So tell us about your project then. So what, what is, so you start an undergrad, you start, uh, you, you fall in love with the ancients, you do a master's degree on ancient philosophy. And as I told you before we started recording, I found a paper of yours where you're talking about Aristotle and dignity from way back in the day. <laughs> and then and then you flesh that out further. So what is your interest in particular in Aristotle as somebody that you want to bring into contemporary conversations? So actually, this whole thought project really began for me out of an, another one of my passions outside of philosophy that we also were talking about earlier Um in the form of social justice and kind of my activism. And that's been a part of my life since I was probably 14 years old, um, kind of starting fundraisers um, and trying to educate and raise funds for organizations that addressed modern day slavery and sex trafficking. And so at a really young age, I became very passionate about that, but also really um, interested in the legal framework and all of the behind the scenes things that feed into human rights on a global scale. And for me, um, I, as I was kind of leaving the addressing that through a Christian framework and coming into it more on a global scale, I, encountered, I guess, the problem that there's not really an adequate answer as to why human dignity ought to serve as the foundation for human rights. Um, And in a way that is able to transcend kind of barriers that are created by different religions or nationalities, so forth, so on. Um. So my thought was, as an undergrad student <laughs> that started this whole project, um, yeah, my thought was that if I could create kind of an outline tracing the conceptual development of human dignity and show that it has played an important role in thought throughout time, that that would be a way to address that question and justify why it ought to serve as a foundation for human rights. Um, And I think naturally, I just thought to start with Aristotle because that is kind of what I fell in love with Mm -hmm. as an undergrad student. Sure. Um, So yeah, I started the project as my, you know, honors thesis in undergrad. Um, And at the time, it was just... Really, that first paper was just trying to argue that dignity existed in Aristotelian ethics, really. Um, And it kind of formed into primarily talking about Aristotle's uh, virtue of magnanimity. Hmm. Um, And I argued that dignity is inextricably tied to Aristotle's virtue of magnanimity and showed how that is an elevated virtue within his framework and how it is more closely related to his idea of human flourishing and how that is kind of the end all, the question stopper, why why we exist, what we seek. Um, and then when I did my MPhil stud in the UK, 
I fleshed that out and kind of used that initial argument as a foundation to then go into really unpack what that conception of dignity looks like for Aristotle and what impact it has on his ethical account. Um, And it ended up being a lot of looking at his moral psychology. So the title of my dissertation is An Aristotelian Conception of Dignity, How Our Thinking and Feeling About Others Impacts Our Moral Excellence. Um, So yeah, that is kind of the overall framework. And I think that in the end, I was able to successfully argue that dignity does play an important role in Aristotelian ethics and also to kind of argue against what often happens within ancient Greek scholarship that magnanimity and dignity are kind of confounded um, because conceptually they are, like I said, inextricably tied, but I view them as very separate. And so being able to argue that dignity serves an independent role and actually you know, serves all of these other virtues that for Aristotle make up the magnanimous man, which I also argue really is what he viewed as kind of the archetypal philosopher leading the ideal life. Hmm. Yeah, because um, you, you, you say that like magnanimity is an ordering of the virtues, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. What, what exactly does that mean? I mean, is that taking the other virtues of uh, like... Uh, is it taking dignity and taking honesty and taking bravery and somehow um, enclosing them into or encasing them into a sort of singular framework that is supposed to be the kind of guiding disposition of uh, of a person? I mean, is that kind of the idea of, of and then that leads to eudaimonia, that leads to human flourishing? How does that how does that work? I guess causally. Yeah. Um, so as I understand it, it. So he says a lot of different things about magnanimity, which is why there is so much scholarship about it. Um, And he does have, you know, a whole account of what magnanimity is in and of itself, namely kind of having a correct um, understanding, self, yeah, having a correct self-concept. But then he does make these comments, like you said, that it's an ordering of the virtues and that it makes the virtues greater and you can't have the other virtues without having magnanimity. So trying to, yeah, causally spell out how all of that works. Um, the way that I understand it is that if, well, you can't have the other virtues and you can't be a virtuous person if you fully, if you're not magnanimous as well, because for Aristotle um, to actually possess the virtue, you have to have all of these other factors. So you can't just... Basically, you're not a generous person if you're doing generous behavior, but um, not in the right way to the right people um, at the right time. There's all of these different factors that make up true virtue for Aristotle. And part of that feeds into, um, yeah, how you view yourself relating to the behavior and to the benefactor of the behavior. Um, yeah, that's so, the, you said the correct self concept earlier. This is have you you've, you know obviously I mean, obviously you know the quote, but there's a quote that's been turned into like it's been bastardized a lot, but it's the famous dignity quote of Aristotle, which is that dignity consists not in possessing honors, but in the consciousness that we deserve them. And a lot of times it's bastardized into like dignity consists not in possessing honors, but in that we deserve them. Yeah. But there's, there's something really, and then that's just like the Instagram, like pat yourself on the back, like, oh, we're so worthy of <laughs> followers and likes, like, you know, like, yeah. like, don't let anyone shit on you. But there's something interesting about that little clause, the, but in the consciousness that, can you, can you flesh that out a little bit? Because actually, I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure this out, because it seems to be that if magnanimity is the ordering of the virtues, and it pertains to this notion of self-consciousness and relating to dignity uh, in relation to all of these other virtues that you have to have kind of like a generous disposition in order to properly be virtuous. I, I'm trying to figure out how self-consciousness factors into this. What does that mean? Is it is it just self-awareness that you're a th- 
that you are a rational animal? I mean, is it something more than that? No. Yeah. So it's, see, I would say the most basic way that I would spell it out is to say that it's having knowledge about yourself as a moral agent. So knowing, Mm. knowing that you are living virtuously, recognizing why that's valuable Um, and then recognizing that because you are virtuous, you possess value. Um, Mm. and so that's really what separates magnanimity and elevates it above the other, um, virtues of character is that there is, it requires an extra degree of intellectual commitment and they have an extra claim to truth. So it's not just saying, you know, oh, I'm a rational animal and I have worth because of that and therefore I possess dignity. Really what's happening is that um, to be magnanimous, you possess all of the virtues and because you understand the way in which you possess them and how you are able to acquire them, through habituation and through having the correct view of yourself and being able to purport yourself correctly to situations time and time again. Mm. Um, And then, and really kind of understanding what the good life is and understanding your role in it, but also, so that's magnanimity and then dignity is not, um, it's really different from what we say that dignity is. So kind of, yeah, post-Kantian, we kind of the more colloquial understanding of dignity now is possessing a worth. And that's really, really different from the way that in which Aristotle uses dignity. So dignity for Aristotle is the Greek word synotes, and it Um, the way he defines it is really just a proper consideration or regard for others. So it's, whereas magnanimity is a self-focused virtue, dignity is what he refers to as a virtue of emotion. So it's slightly different from the virtues of character, but it is other focused. And that's kind of why I think it's very important to separate magnanimity and dignity. So they make up the same knowledge and dignity is required for magnanimity, but it's different insofar as it, yeah, it's focused and directed at others. So, but it, at the same time, it involves that self-concept. So mm. if you're magnanimous, you understand that you're worthy of honor because you are virtuous, but to possess dignity, it means that that translates into your interactions with others and you are correctly ascertaining the way in which you ought to think and feel about others. So you're not thinking about others too much and thinking of yourself not enough and you're not thinking of others not enough and thinking of yourself too much. So the extremes, because obviously... Again, Aristotle, the golden mean. Yeah. yeah, Aristotle's doctrine of the mean... So the extremes on either side would be vanity and pusillanimity. Um, Hmm. So dignity is that sweet spot where you're correctly getting how you're supposed to interact with those around you. And it is inextricably tied to your uh, like true understanding of yourself as a moral agent. Hmm. Did you, did you ever read Paul Bloom's against empathy? Ooh, no, but I love empathy. I know. <laughs> well, so here's empathy. I know. Okay, so me too. Like it, it factors really heavily in my book that's going to be coming out. But what I mean by empathy is, is there's a distinction between like rational empathy, cognitive empathy, and affective empathy. And then there's a difference between that and what's called emotional contagion that neuroscientists make it, that like to talk about. Emotional contagion is where you get so caught up in the emotion that you kind of like lose yourself and you can't make a distinction. Mm-hmm. Affective empathy is kind of a step removed from that. It still takes place at a pre-conscious or um, a, a pre-awareness level. Um, and then 
you know, rational empathy is where you kind of make uh, a decision based on this felt connection, you know, that you could biologically like derive from mirror neurons or something like that, whatever, right? There are all different ways of, of discussing like the value of empathy. But Paul Bloom comes along and he says, listen, empathy sometimes isn't really all that valuable because it can enclose us into like our immediate circles. Like we feel empathy only for those that we're immediately connected with. And what he argues for is something that he calls rational compassion. And what I wonder is, is what you're talking about, if it doesn't fit really well into that distinction, not to the neglect of empathy, because I actually think that that Bloom's book is a little bit reductive or a little bit dismissive of maybe the potency and the value of empathy, but yeah. understood within maybe different parameters than he allows at least. Um, but nevertheless, there is something that seems very interesting about how you're describing the relationship between magnanimity and having a correct self-concept and dignity and being properly attuned outwards to others as being these two like co-constitutive, um, like necessary elements of the virtue person that then frame what it means to have quote unquote rational compassion in Paul Bloom's words or to be um, a sort of a, a, a being that is on the way towards uh, human flourishing or that is like fulfilling a telos or something along those lines. So I don't know. It, it felt like an interesting way to maybe kind of frame frame things. Yeah. And I think another reason why I'm so drawn to ancient Greek philosophy is that the way in which they do philosophy is they are very receptive to talking about emotions and the importance of emotion. And really, when I began my dissertation and really started to unpack this Aristotelian conception of dignity, I wasn't thinking that I was going to end up talking about emotions, but that ended up being really the bulk of my dissertation was kind of unpacking Aristotle's moral psychology and really looking at the relationship between cognition and emotion for Aristotle and what that means, like what it actually means to properly consider others and what that consists of and what that looks like outwardly. Um, and I think that it's something that I just on a personal level really appreciate because I think that um, philosophy, at least in academia philosophy, like formal philosophy, I think that there really is Maybe this is generalized. Probably no, say is, it. But, <laughs> throw, go ahead. Throw that fiery dart. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, I think that there is a real issue in not – there's such a in, – and in not acknowledging the importance of emotion and overemphasizing rational thought. Um, yeah, fuck. Didn't they see the movie Inside Out? We, <laughs> we know that emotions are essentially a part of all cognitive activities. Like – this is something that the Troy and I have talked about all the time too, is that like Heidegger talks about the ontological mood, but like, even if you're just sitting there reading in what you think is this like pure rational state of analysis, no, you're still fucking, there's an, there's emotion going on there. Like you cannot, yeah. everything is emotional. Like the tone in our voice, the way that I look at the sunshine is, is affected by, and then is being transformed at an emotional level. Like there yeah. is no such thing as thought or embodied consciousness that is not emotional and so i don't understand when people make a distinction between well that's rational or that's just based on emotion that's completely neglecting what it means to be fucking human yep yeah and i think so this is related but sort of different i was reading martha nussbaum's i think most recent book um about fear and its role in politics mm. mostly focusing on the current situation in the states but I came across this quote and I actually wrote it down because, and this is again, well after my dissertation and my vibe and all of this, but it really, the way she phrased it really captured what I was saying earlier about kind of my appreciation for the ancient Greeks. She said, academics can be too detached from human realities to do good work about the texture of human life. That's a risk inherent in academic freedom and tenure, wonderful institutions that did not protect philosophers of most earlier eras. My own commitments and efforts have always led me to want to restore to philosophy the wide set of concerns that it had in the days of the Greeks and Romans, concerns with the emotions and the struggle for flourishing lives and troubled times, with love and friendship, with the human lifespan, with the hope for a just world. And I thought that that was, well, very eloquently put, but also just, as I said, really captured the motivation behind my project because... 
I think that it's really important to understand that we can spend all day, you know, um, in a room thinking about what is the right way to live and what it is, what does it mean to be an ethical agent in this world? And what does that look like? But at the end of the day, we, you know, one of Aristotle's most deeply rooted assumptions and beliefs is that humans are essentially social beings. And that leads to issues in trying to understand what he actually viewed as the, the best life, whether that was spent in philosophical contemplation or in morally excellent behavior. But I think that giving full weight to that belief and seeing it play out kind of in Aristotle's thought, which is what I tried to do in my dissertation and showing that actually you can't be a moral agent just because you've figured it out. You have to, you have to actually feel and think about others in the correct way. And it has to be something that makes a difference in your life. I I don't know if you paid attention to the kerfuffle on Twitter lately, but it was, I, I can't remember what the details were, but it was basically that there was like, the question was, is can you be an ethics professor but be a bad person, <laughs> right? And uh, people were kind of like tweeting about that. And I don't remember if there was like an ethics professor that got in trouble. I, I don't know exactly what happened. I, I can't remember. But I just remember that they turned into this like shitstorm where everyone was talking about, what, you don't think it's possible to analyze ethics but uh, in your own life, be an asshole? And there is something to this that, that I think is oftentimes missed in um, – like a, a simple theoretical or discursive field. Because when you look at where ancient philosophy emerged from, it totally did emerge from like, what is the good life? Like, what does it mean to, to live a good life? And then let's figure out how to order our lives now, our yeah. city state here. Like, let's figure out how to do that. And I think that's part of the reason why why the Christian tradition took up so many of these themes um, as being integral to cultivating personal piety, right? Mm-hmm. And... Um, I mean, you find this also in in ancient Roman philosophers. You know, Marcus Aurelius was known for sitting down and just like writing uh, about himself and his failings or his uh, mostly his failings. He's pretty hard on himself when you read his uh, when you read his musings, but <laughs> um, mostly about like kind of examining his day and saying, "What did I do right and what did I do wrong and how can I do things better?" And uh, the the Christian tradition, of course, takes this over with especially the monastic communities where it's simply about cultivating personal piety. And I wonder if that isn't something that that oftentimes is missed. And without trying to reclaim some sense of like puritanical self-flagellation and the mortification of sin that you get in like these austere figures like John Owens um, during like these like uh, religious enlightenment phases, but... But rather, if there's a way to still have like a, a genuine concern for personal piety that doesn't stand at odds with social justice or that isn't at odds with economic justice or that isn't at odds with fighting for um, these various grand global issues that we recognize as ethical concerns. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's really hard, I, especially now it seems like because there's a real desire to reclaim the moral you know, I mean, you have someone like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez who's arguing about like a Green New Deal and all these things based on it being moral. You have Bernie who's saying we want Medicare for all. And when they challenge him and they're like, why? Where do these rights come from? He's like, because we're human. Like yeah. there is this sense of dignity and morality um, that is kind of like shifting the landscape so that people aren't afraid of this idea of piety. But my concern is like at what point does it tip over into like a puritanical morality where you – flagellate yourselves, but then at the same time, um, how do you also fit social justice into these concerns? I, I know I just threw a shitload of stuff at you, so sorry, but, um, but you know what I mean? Like, there is something interesting in this notion of piety um, in relation to social justice without falling into the trappings of, like, puritanical uh, mortification of sin kind of stuff. Yeah. And well, I don't really know what the answer is. No, I don't either. And I think that, again, um, both... And I don't think it's something unique to religion either. I think that also philosophy is um, like that quote I read at the level of academia. Um, there, when you're when you are spending a lot of time in you know lost in contemplation or philosophical thought, and you're writing three hundred page dissertation, 
and spending so much time in isolation and you're just in your mind and you're figuring this stuff out, that's, that's definitely philosophy. Um, and it's valuable, but also I think philosophy, I think a lot is figured out when you do philosophy in conversation and that, um, I think that that is actually doing philosophy and Hmm. I think that perhaps maybe the reason why I value that and I view it as beneficial and also necessary to maybe to do that in conjunction with spending time alone in philosophical contemplation. But yeah, I think that having that human connection kind of grounds philosophy and it, it, benefits philosophical thought in such a way that it reminds us of our humanness and it it really draws out that dimension of emotion and the experience of others and you're not just in your own mind trying to work out all the details of your reality and I think um I think it's really valuable but I also think that it affords philosophy with value that can't happen just sitting alone in an office on your computer like having this conversation right now I think is important for drawing those things out and you know having real human interaction and allowing allowing that to affect your thoughts and it doesn't have to detract from like we were saying earlier it doesn't have to detract from your rational thoughts Mm. but allowing it to be a factor and not kind of negating that whole side of being human, but allowing it to kind of filter through and you're still making judgments about your experience. But I don't know if any of that makes sense, but <laughs> no, it, it does. I mean, I, I talk with um, like young budding academics often and, you know, people are always asking for advice and there's grad school Twitter where people are constantly sharing their stories so that people that are now coming into the field can learn from and stuff. And and one of the things I tell people, and I don't think this is just exclusive to philosophy, but I do think it's uh, particularly potent for philosophers or people that are philosophically inclined to engage in community. Like when I think about some of the best, if not the best and most formative philosophical encounters that I've had, they've not been me reading a text. Yeah, I've had plenty of oh shit moments. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I studied at a private Christian college for my undergrad. And I remember when I first read Jean-Francois Lyotard, and this is during the, the, the heyday of the emerging church. I don't know if that means anything to you. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was this movement in like 2009-ish. Well, probably it started before then, but it like culminated in like 2007 to 2010. And it was like... Uh, it was like this movement of, of Christians who were embracing postmodern thought and post-structuralism mm-hmm. and critical race theory and like decolonial thought and stuff like yeah. that. And um, it really threatened the, the conservative Protestant communities that I was embedded in. You know, I went to um, a private institution where, you know, it's kind of Calvinist, but kind of evangelical at the same time, a very famous American <laughs> pastor <laughs> that if I said his name, I'd out myself too much, but you'd know who I'm talking about. Okay. Of course, I'm, I think we've said it before on the podcast, but I try not to talk too much shit because I still, I still have attachments. I still love the place, even though yeah. I've moved outside of it. But, but I remember being there and I read Jean-Francois Lyotard, The Postmodern Condition. And the thing that was so amazing was, is that I had that moment where I was like, oh shit, like, postmodernism isn't this boogeyman that I should be afraid of, like my church elders are telling me at this moment. It doesn't just mean relativism and like moral relativism and that there is no gro- foundation or grounding. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It's, it's, it's something much more complex. And, and I was like, okay, well, that's interesting. But it didn't really come to flower until I met Troy, the guy who co-hosts the podcast. Mm-hmm. And we had this little community of people where we would go get Chinese food at mm-hmm. this place called Mandarin Wong. And it was me and Troy and Trey and Michaela and Diana and another guy named Austin. And we would sit there and we would just fucking talk. And we would talk about everything from life to thought to religion to love to basketball to anime, which wasn't my thing, but that was Austin, the other Austin's thing, you know, I mean, whatever, like we talk about literature. And I think I grew more in those moments than I did uh, in just sitting in my room reading Leotard, even though I had those oh shit moments. And it really, it lit a, it lit a, a spark, 
but it didn't catch flame until it was exposed to like the oxygen, which kind of makes sense because, you know, humans breathe oxygen, I guess. But but it, <laughs> it, it, it needed that, right? It needed that something much more combustible to share. And and I always tell grad students, I'm like, find a fucking community wherever you go. Whatever, yeah. whatever university you're attending, find reading groups that you can be a part of, community groups, organizations where you can serve, whatever it is that is your thing, like proactively find that stuff because that it, it, it will make your thought flower. It's like this, it, it will take the seed and turn it into something that can germinate and you can have this like efflorescent experience of the, in, the totality, I think, of what philosophy can be outside of it just being a stale discipline. And unfortunately, like you said, in academia, it oftentimes is a stale discipline. Yeah. And I think that um, in really the past year and a half, I've been, I haven't been formally involved in ph- philosophy, academia, like I was, which has been a weird transition for me. But I had several experiences that kind of led me to take a step back for now anyway. And they were experiences that were kind of disheartening for that very reason. Namely that, like I was saying earlier, this whole motivation behind my project was because I saw a huge gap in um, maybe just law, but also just human thought and being able to explain what, like, explain why human dignity ought to serve as the foundation. And that's so crucial. Being able to, even if human dignity doesn't end up being the foundation, being able to address that and have a justified response to why we ought to secure rights, basic fundamental human rights for people that are experiencing severe injustices across the world, the fact that we can't answer that is a huge problem and that's a huge gap and I really wanted to be able to answer that and I thought you know my whole proposed solution and the way of tracing the conceptual development throughout the history of thought which would be definitely a lifelong project (laughs) but Mm. I think that again like my whole motivation behind my philosophical project was trying to address a problem in the real world and the way that I view philosophy is just doing that philosophy to me well no it's not just to me I think it's just the fact of matter that philosophy undergirds everything in society it you know it it, it is the framework and the foundation for our political systems our economic systems our interactions with others our theology and I think that because philosophy has, you know, separated itself so much that people have lost that knowledge that that is what philosophy is and that is what philosophy is capable of. Mm. And I remember, I won't say where I was, but I was at a, <laughs> I was at a conference um, for philosophy. Um, it was kind of one of the last things that I did. And it was at a very well-respected institution and I was with a bunch of PhD students and I had just submitted my dissertation for my MPhil. So I was, you know, of course, getting the question, are you going to do your PhD? And I, at the time, was really on the fence about it and I ended up having this conversation with a one of the PhD students at that university and he was asking me kind of, my project and my motivation behind what I wanted to do and I was spelling out for him everything that I just said and he point blank looked at me and he said you know don't do a PhD in philosophy because you can achieve that other ways and like what did he say to me he said something like you know philosophy PhDs are for people that are doing it for the intrinsic love of philosophy and nothing else they enjoy nothing else and that really was my experience like these people were didn't see outside philosophy they wanted to just sit and write papers and Mm. it was very disheartening for me to realize that I could write I could you know spend years of my life working on this dissertation that would maybe make a difference and spawn this project maybe other people could get involved and we could get rally around trying to provide this account of human dignity and really rise the occasion of really seeking out a way to 
show that it can serve as a foundation um, and be an adequate foundation. But at the end of the day, no one's going to read this because philosophy has so separated itself. And if there was more awareness that philosophy can be done in community with others, and there definitely, I'm not trying to say, you know, there is no distinction to be made between philosophy at that level versus just philosophy talking with friends at dinner or something like that. But I think, yeah, it is really important to keep that distinction, sure, but also stop giving so much weight to it and stop acting like philosophy is something for white men with a PhD to do. (laughs) And Mm. that that's the space for philosophy and philosophy. There's no space for philosophy in the real world, if that makes sense. And I think that that's something that really comes through in Aristotle's thought. Like, yeah, the best life is one of philosophical contemplation, but human beings are essentially social beings. And that makes a difference because, you know, for Aristotle, he's saying, yeah, that is the best life because that is the closest to the life of a God. But, you know, we can only become godlike to a certain point. And so, and that point is that we are social beings. So that's the best life. And so far as, you know, have a leisurely life, definitely think through the hard problems of life, have a true self-concept. But it's also very important to be a moral agent, act as such, and have important friendships that are based on virtue. Mm. And that make that is part of the life of philosophical contemplation. It's not just that of itself. And I think that's how you make change. I think that's how you see um, progress. And mm. I don't know. Yeah, I think that another thing that I did alongside my degree in London was this really cool project that's happening in the UK and I really wish that it was happening in the States right now with the political climate there but also you know here in Australia um, and it was that you would go into schools from primary schools to high school and do philosophy sessions mm. and it was amazing. I did it. I think I had a class of year six students and I would go in and, you know, it looks very differently and they have, you basically present a stimulus in the form of a story or, you know, some visual, but it basically prompts them without them even knowing it to be, to eventually they're talking about the existence of God and, you know, language and what, what it means is is a chair actually a chair and it's these 10 year olds and they're doing philosophy and they would get so passionate about it and they loved it and they were good at it. And it was really encouraging for me because again, like I said, like I didn't experience philosophy until I was in my philosophy of religion class when I was 18 years old and see like having young people, encounter philosophy and become aware, especially young women or young girls become aware that they can do philosophy and philosophy has space for them. Mm. And that it, it is something that should be a part of the human experience. Um, it's not just something to be done in a university. It is something that as Aristotle argues is part of what it means to live the best life to consider your own life and to consider your interactions with others in a thoughtful way. Um, Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I would even want to stay on that further and say, I think that, that there's something intrinsic about human imagination that is the seed of what turns into formal philosophy later that, Mm -hmm. you know, Socrates says philosophy begins with wonder or amazement. And it's this yeah. idea that there's a puzzle, that there's something to figure out, that you're overwhelmed and you can't enclose or incorporate this object of inquiry into your current schema of rationality. And so you are like 
overcome by the sublime or by the transcendent or by the more or something. And I think if you look at children, children do that naturally. Yeah. That's what asking why is. That's why when parents get frustrated and it's like, I don't know why, just because, God damn it. But <laughs> the point is, is because the child has a mind that says, I, I'm curious as to why the fabric of the world is the way that it is. And I think this actually really ties into the reason that Socrates was ultimately uh, sentenced to death or exile. It shows death. But um, with the reason that the he children. was... <laughs> That's it, corrupting the youth by saying, yep. ask questions, yep. ask about power. And you're talking about women in particular. And then let's talk about this in translation to people of color. Yep. To have a skepticism towards uh, structures of power, to question the foundations upon which the quote unquote, like global fabric, the global fabric of justice is built is something that is so important for democratic freedom. Um, but let's say even further than that, because that's still an abstraction for human freedom. Well, that's still an abstraction, but let's keep going and, and unpacking this, this, what is freedom? It's like, we don't even really maybe know what freedom <laughs> is, but we can't start asking that question and then coming up with proper solutions unless we have that dispositional framework to the world that wants to challenge and contest the things that are. And that's why I that's why I found Marx. That's why I found like post Marxist literature. That's why I found Sartre and post Kantian philosophy. And that's why I'm interested more in in like the Continental School of Thought because it it really appeals to my I guess inward rebellious teenage spirit that is still <laughs> there. You know. Yeah. Um, but I think you see that with children that's just kind of naturally and we stifle it. You know, this is what Sir Ken Robinson says is that our education system cuts out the imagination and cuts out creativity yeah. because we want to turn people into efficient workers or we want to turn them into uh, entrepreneurs that can just kind of produce for the proliferation of capital or whatever. Um, and, and it really does seem to stifle something that is really integral to the human spirit per se. And I, I love the idea of trying to cultivate that thing. Whatever yeah, and I think it's really natural. So the organization, just for anyone listening, because I think it's worth looking into, and they have videos that you can see the kids doing philosophy. It's called the Philosophy Foundation. Um, and I really, really wish that other countries would implement something like this in schools. But it, yeah, I mean, they're sitting there talking about, oh, can you step in the same river twice? And getting really excited <laughs> about it. And But also they are because it's it's doing philosophy and that's such a thing that they emphasize at the foundation is that you know we're not going in and teaching elementary students philosophy and lecturing them we're going in we're presenting them and then you step back so you're not even really a teacher you're what um i think facilitator is the word that we were made to use hmm. um but yeah they they're doing philosophy and they're getting, they're having, they're given the space to think through these things that they're actually really passionate about. And, mm. but at the same time, they're developing hard skills and being able to formulate and articulate their thoughts about these important topics and also engage in conversation with their peers and talk things through. And um, most of the schools that the foundation works with are kind of schools that are underfunded and mm. so typically it's students that aren't receiving the same quality of education as you know better funded schools and so yeah it's giving these students the space to develop these skills and think things through and sometimes they weren't good I mean they don't always get it right and they're not you know having civil conversations all the time but they all were very excited about it and passionate about it and capable of doing it. And if if we could recognize the value in that and kind of, like I said, kind of implement it elsewhere rather than just in London and a few other places in the UK, um, I think that it would make a huge difference because it gives kids the space to think things through on their own, especially I grew up in the South and... I think it's very typical, the South and the States, and it's very typical to just grow up and you're Christian and that's that. Um, and I think, you know, I thought that my political views were very different than they are just because I wasn't really given the space to think things through on my own until I was taking a politics class in high school. <laughs> hmm. um, and 
which is interesting because at the same time, like I was, I've just, I've always been a naturally kind of critical thinker and I would think through my religious beliefs and be kind of objective about those. But when you're not prompted to think through things, you don't necessarily. And I think that developing those skills in children is very important because, um, perhaps maybe we wouldn't have the issue that we see on social media today of people just not um, <laughs> correctly engaging in discourse about things that they disagree about. Um, so developing those skills, I think, would see a shift in society and how we interact with one another and would better um, set up kind of the platform for making progress and kind of yeah, moving forward and being able to actually engage in productive conversations rather than just yelling at each other mm. behind computer screens, but also <laughs> yeah. um, doing it, cultivating just the simple idea that I can do philosophy for children of color, for mm. female children. Yeah, it empowers them is what you're saying. Yeah, and I, it's mm. such, I mean, you look at the drop-off rate for, you know, people of color, for women and philosophy, and it's astonishing. And I, I mean, I've, felt it myself I've dropped off and I never would have thought that I would have mm. you know I was one of three students doing female students doing a info I went in and I was like yeah philosophy's you know has a bad rap for a f- as a field for women but I was because I was lucky enough to be surrounded by professors in undergrad that really supported me and encouraged me um, I went in with an idea and an excitement that I could, you know, change that or it didn't bother me. But at some point, like, it's so implicit that philosophy is something that's set apart and it's for white men (laughs) for the PhD that it eventually it does get to you. And I think that getting away from that and like we've talked about, like there is scholarship that's addressing that and it's really important. And I read few things and um really appreciate the work that scholars are doing on that but at the same time like there is a there is a need to address that and I think that not only addressing that would benefit philosophy I think that um bring you know breaking down that implicit belief a bit would also benefit society um just on a personal level of allowing people the space to think through their own thoughts but also kind of relationally for people in society to like I saw and the children that I worked with um, being able to engage in philosophical discourse in a productive manner I think is also incredibly important hmm. yeah I, I agree um, I mean I think one of the things too that's a little bit disheartening is it seems like a lot of the criticisms that are that are able to be leveled against philosophy and that are allowing, you know, people of color, minority voices, decolonial studies and things like that. The problem is, is they're still not within the discipline of quote unquote philosophy. Yep. They're in like adjacent disciplines, you know, gender studies or uh, colonial studies or, you know, Asian studies or something along those lines and then you get people that are able to level their criticism against the field of philosophy and they're able to do philosophy. Like I'm always amazed in the Anglo-American world at how many people are doing work on French philosophy that are in French departments, not in philosophy departments. Yeah. But they're literally writing French they're writing philosophy books, you know, and they're they're engaging in philosophical thoughts and philosophical figures. But it's just that the discipline of philosophy for some reason, has restricted itself so much. And it's made philosophy turn into a very sort of limited parameter of academic type of investigation. That it, yeah. it, 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 I mean, when you talk with the average person on the street, for the most part, I, I get negative responses when you bring up philosophy. They're like, oh, I oh, hated yeah. philosophy, you know? Yeah, and it's, yeah, there's all of these assumptions from the outside world about philosophy and oh, you know, philosophy degree is useless or, you know. Uh, and it's our fault. 
And by R, I mean like white men that um, are in the academic philosophical world. Like we have perpetuated this stale understanding of what philosophy has become over the years. Yeah. And, I, you know, from time to time you see that article, look at all these successful people that shockingly have a degree in philosophy that are now running this huge corporation or, right. you, you know, but if the fact that it's, you know, a point to find 12 people that have found <laughs> success outside of philosophy, you know, <laughs> right. And the fact that I have relatives sending it to me like, Oh, you know, there's hope for you. <laughs> there's hope, right? Don't worry. Um, well, it's like that joke. What can you do with an English degree? And it's kind of like, well, what the fuck can you do with a philosophy degree? You know, it's, it, it's true. People do kind of think that it's useless. I remember when I was like, oh, I'm just going to study philosophy. They're like, why? Yeah. I'm like, and what are you going to do with that? I'm like, I can do whatever the fuck I want. I mean, yeah, I, and I, and I think I that it is like very troublesome assumptions, but yeah, real. I'm really passionate about kind of challenging that because I view mm. the same way that Aristotle did that philosophy, although it is, you know, something that he conceived of as a leisurely activity, it is ultimately productive and it's meant to serve a purpose. We're not just supposed mm. to sit back and think through things and, you know, smoke pipe and whatever. Um, Which is fine. Smoke your pipe and do your thing. But just, you know, there are other purposes as well out there. Yeah. Okay, I have one, I have one more question. And then we'll, let's go ahead and wrap it up because I've taken enough of your time on this <laughs> Saturday morning. Um, so... The, we didn't even really get to get into other issues of like social justice really and like kind of like the larger project that you're interested in. But um, maybe that could be a, another topic for another time, which yeah. would be interesting to tie in Aristotle and this this work that you're trying to work through about tracing the idea of human dignity and how would that sort of subvert or transform maybe these larger universal declarations about human dignity and, and maybe kind of provide a more substantial foundation for it. But before we, or we'll leave that kind of aside. The last thing I want to say is everything that we're talking about right now, the sort of failings of philosophy and your desire to try to reintroduce it or to try to find a seed of, of, of creativity or of flowering. How do you think that the current social media landscape allows or disallows for that to happen? We kind of briefly talked about it, like you were talking about how people are kind of just fighting anonymously and it, it leads to tensions and whatnot. Is it just a medium? Is it, it a problem of the medium or is it there's something larger at a cultural level? Is it because we no longer respect the ancient ways or, or what, what do you think it is? Like, we, is it, as some people would say, you know, you get people like the Jordan Petersons of the world who want to blame neo-Marxist postmodernism and, um, and therefore he wants to like kind of like reclaim some universal foundations because the world's going mad it's just chaos you know <laughs> and he's got to be the dragon slayer that slays the chaos or whatever like what do you think it is that we're confronting in the world i guess that would allow us to either identify some obstacles and then to maybe overcome those obstacles um, so that philosophy can actually have a transformative effect hmm. i guess more than anything what i'm wondering is if we look at the world now where we are inundated by images and spectacles and people are more and more becoming consumed with themselves becoming images that we're reproducing. How does that present an obstacle for philosophical inquiry to really take root and become this flowering, um, to become this thing that can really cultivate bodies that are going to contest power structures rather than just reproduce them. Because it seems like, from my perspective, and you know, we complain about on this podcast quite a bit, that social media is oftentimes, it's cultivating a negative social, um, it's cultivating negative social tendencies. And it's not just that people are fighting um, and that people aren't willing to engage in rational debate, but it seems to be something deeper than that. And I'm trying to understand what that deeper thing is. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on the current state of technology and social media landscape that are maybe infringing upon our capacities to really explore these greater philosophical concerns that seem to drive your uh, interests. Yeah. So I think that there's no denying that, you know, advancements in technology and the pervasiveness of social media and daily use of social media 
in our lives has radically changed society and inter- our interactions with one another and kind of the whole flirting with the Marxist notion of technological determination and stuff like that. But um, I think that perhaps on a more deeper level and perhaps trying to relate it to what we've talked about, I think that, yeah, in addition to the obvious effects that it's contributed to vast globalization and you can be connected to anyone in any place whenever you want with the internet and social media and um, that leads to you know jumping to conclusions sooner and making faster judgments because everything is quick 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 but I think on a deeper level like a more subtle thing that's happening and more subtle consequence of social media is that it really is changing our concept of ourself and our experience as social beings. So it's really fundamentally changed what it means to be a social being because now we look at things like Instagram and Facebook and our interactions on those platforms as being social um but if we kind of want to challenge that and you know what is how does that factor in and like how is that altering our own experience of ourselves and our interactions with others because it it really is I mean it's taking it's adding in an extra layer in between our interactions with others um and I think that that is going to have an impact insofar as it's, I guess, maybe watering down the idea that how we think and feel about others actually impacts our ourselves. Um, because, yeah, on the surface level, it's, you know, there's the whole comparison thing aspect of social media but also you are you're seeing people as images or you're seeing tragedies as images and something that's on a screen and you're making judgments about those people or those events in relation to yourself and that's a very different experience than engaging with another human being or experiencing an event or um, putting yourself, you know, empathizing. Um, Yeah. That's, that's my concern is, is, is that it abstracts away too much. And, and human thought is essentially abstractive. Like when you call something a tree, you're abstracting from this kind of like otherwise infinite thing that is standing in front of you that could be talked about in a billion different ways. But so we can't get away from abstraction. And I, I, and what I wonder is, is precisely what you said earlier about like the speed at which we're encountering these abstractions. So like if we all had like an hour a day to sit there and meditate on a single image that came (laughs) across our purview, that would be very different, right? Like if I saw an image of war-torn Yemen and I was in a room and I was able to meditate. And then afterwards, I got together with my community and we talked about it and we shared ideas. And then we talked with somebody from Yemen somehow and they shared their ideas. Like that's a very different thing than having in the frame of 30 seconds, 30 images or more when you're flipping through on Instagram so quickly. And so what I wonder is, is it's actually kind of, it's too much empathy or or if there's a way that it's like an abstracted empathy. And so it actually sort of, yeah, um, I think that it, um, this just popped into my head, so it hasn't been, you know, ruminated over, but I'm Mm. thinking that maybe, um, a thing that, you know, maybe something that's happening is that, because I'm thinking back to my experience and when I first got involved and really passionate about social justice, as I said, I was 14 and I think maybe I'd just gone to Facebook, but Instagram didn't exist yet. Twitter wasn't a thing. Um, so I was 14 and encountering stories in the way of watching documentaries and reading um, reports or memoirs and stuff like that. And 
because I was taking in information about these severe injustices in that way, it gave me space to cultivate empathy. Whereas, yeah, I'm reflecting even on my own experience now and the way in which I interact with tragedy and injustice now, it's because I'm constantly inundated with it and its images and it's, you know, rapid fire. It is really different and you don't sit there and think about and truly give time and space to cultivate empathy. You, you know? You see yeah, I mean, it you I see like, it and you're go ahead, yeah. You see it and you're oh, you know, that hurts to see and I am sick of seeing this stuff and it's all the time and it's a completely different experience than really taking it in and thinking about it, empathizing, um, which I think naturally for most people leads you to want to do something about it versus if you're constantly inundated with rapid fire images and, you know, bad news and strongly worded opinions about various things, you, it, it's, it's unnatural. And I think that it, it's almost like overload and can't cope. And you just kind of flip the switch of you interact with all of that information very differently. And I think that it just happens at a subconscious level. Yeah, a, a good friend of mine, uh, she's a, an academic and she talks a lot about how she doesn't want violent images flooding into her feed. And this isn't a woman who's a prude. This isn't a woman who's like a, a conservative. I mean, this is a she's actually a Marxist scholar, very prominent Marxist feminist scholar. So it's not like she's opposed to a certain histories of violence or anything yeah. like that but she's like I don't I don't want to have this stuff constantly filtering through my feed because it does I don't remember what she calls it it's like the passive reception of violence yeah. or something like that and talks about how it how it impacts us in a negative way because it deadens us it anesthetizes us to the impact of what happens to the sort of desacralization of the body and I don't know yeah, it, I think I, it's almost yeah. maybe what's happening I'm now very kind of self-reflective right now, (laughs) but um, I think that you lose the need, the natural need to empathize because empathy is something that arises almost similar in such a way that philosophy begins in wonder. I think empathy begins almost in a, in a shock. Um, And you're, you're forced by some, you know, either emotive or cognitive event to consider others and consider how it would, it would affect you. But you're not, when you're constantly inundated with these images, yeah, I think you're conditioned to view it as commonplace and it's just happening all the time. So there, you lose that sense of shock when you encounter these images. And I think without that shock without that cognitive or emotive event occurring you just don't feel that need to empathize you do for sure on a superficial level but I'm talking about thinking back to my 14 year old self and encountering and really learning about other people's experience in that way it affected me in such a different way than when I see things now um Mm. and it's because you're conditioned to experience those things as not something worth really belaboring over i guess i don't know i mean i don't even know if we have the tools to be able to really contemplate the abstracted images that are coming before us and so it's a like i've heard some people say it's an we're inundated with empathy and that all it is is feeling and i'm not sure that that's accurate i think that if we're going to be more precise, it seems like we're inundated with abstract empathic images. But the problem is it doesn't yeah. really – it doesn't have the deep empathy, which is I think the thing that, that you're talking about, which is yeah. what turns into action, which turns into compassion, which turns into something that tr- changes you and not to put the cliche on it, but it puts you in the other person's shoes, yeah. right? And And I don't know that social media is really – about empathy because it's actually about a deadening 
of our ability to actually empathize. Yeah. And and that's something very different. So it's almost it's almost like if you eat too much sugar or if you uh, drink too much booze, then you become immune to it, right? It's like that kind of thing. It, yeah, it's you almost love a tolerance. Yeah, it's like we've built up a, an empathy tolerance, but it's through abstracted images because it's not a tri- like I don't know. But then soldiers experience this too when they're in the physical realm as well. So it's not something that only occurs at the level of like a digital image. It also occurs at the level of like a mental image. Um, and, and so I think there's just some, there's a deeper problem here that, a, that I know we're not going to be able to solve right now because yeah. like, I've, I've <laughs> chewed your fucking ear off and yeah, yeah, your, your Saturday morning is gone. Um, but, um, but I think that at least if we start considering these things, that this kind of opens up some doors for fruitful thought. Do you agree? Yeah, I definitely would agree with that. Yeah. Well, sick. Kendall, thank you so much for coming on and chatting. Um, where can people find you on the internet so they can ask you questions, engage with you further, or anything else? Oh, yes. Um, perhaps visiting my website would be the first point of entry, which would be uh, www.kindlegilfillin.com. Cool. And I'll put a link in the show notes so it, people can find it that way. Uh, where else? Perfect. Um, my Instagram. I'm always sharing kind of my thoughts and books that I've been reading, um, lectures happening, seminars happening, um, which would just be at KM Gilfillan. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Um, I would like to be the foil to the PhD student that dissuaded you from doing further research. And I would like to say that I do think that there is value in doing a PhD. Um, but he is right that most people do it just out of because they're obsessed with philosophy and they don't have larger political or social concerns. But I always think there's a way around it. It's about how you can slip yourself in there. So I, I'm, I'm favorable, but then again, I'm a big nerd. and. I will probably never leave the academic world in some way or another. I'll always have a toe in somehow, you know. Okay, well, cool. Well, thank you so much. We'll chat with you later. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's go on to our next segment. This is the Sticky Leaves. This is where one of us talks about whatever it is that's giving us meaning in a potentially meaningless universe. So, Austin, what's doing it for you this week? So I, I've been in one of those like research holes where I haven't really done anything entertaining. I mentioned it, I believe, in the shitty minute that I, I recently saw the Hudsucker proxy, but really that's kind of it. I haven't done anything, I guess, entertainment-wise that I can recommend to people. You know, I mean, I've gone out and I've had some nights out and that's all been great, but, you know, I talk about that shit all the time. So I'm like, what can I recommend uh, with full heart? And I've been really taken recently by a particular historian and I wanted to just basically recommend him and then his works uh, kind of come out of that more than anything because I think across the board from what I can tell uh, he just seems to be doing some very interesting and I think important work with regards to um, analyzing historically analyzing but then also conceptually analyzing this thing that we call neoliberalism so you know if you listen to our last episode we talked about Kotzko and Martin Konings and their uh, different approaches to analyzing, criticizing neoliberalism. Well, Quinn Slobodian, um, it's S-L-O-B-O-D-I-A-N. That's a great name. Uh, It is a fucking great name. Quinn Slobodian. He is an historian in the U.S., and he wrote a book called Globalists that is about the kind of history of uh, this this term neoliberalism. I mean, it's got a short history, right? It doesn't really go back to the Renaissance, although I'm sure somebody could create some genealogy that goes back to fucking ancient whatever. But um, it's got a relatively young history. And so he looks at the early 20th century and a lot of the key figures and uh, their ideas that helped to kind of develop, if you will, this regime of governmentality that we call neoliberalism. And he comes at it from a very different perspective. He actually comes at it from uh, from a perspective that's very similar to Martin Konings, which we talked about last week, that there isn't this um, unfettering of markets or what's sometimes referred to as this disembedding um, uh, of like liberal uh, ideology, but that there's actually what he calls an encasing between uh, the state and uh, capital. Um, so, so yeah, so he kind of, he comes at uh, addressing neoliberalism in a way that is 
novel in a sort of macro developmental perspective. Um, but then similarly, he kind of, in the process of doing his historical analysis, it's like really good economic history or, or sociological history. It's kind of something along those lines. Or maybe even historical sociology, something along those lines. I'm not sure what you would call his discipline or methodology, but like I said, he is a historian. And um, he also has a really good article called Neoliberalism's Populist Bastards. Great name and great title. Like, this is some good shit, man. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, the subtitle is A New Political Divide Between National Economies. And he's basically basically observing what we discussed with, you know, uh, in the last episode when when Adam Kotzko talks about like the rise of these nationalisms that need to be incorporated into our analysis in our political economic analysis and we can't just simply engage at the level of pure economism right and so uh, Slobodian is basically in this article doing a sort of historical analysis but also conceptual historical conceptual analysis of uh, a couple of key figures within this emerging authoritarian neoliberalism that has taken hold in uh, in Europe. And again, like I said, it's he comes at it from a novel perspective and it's um, I think it's just really rich in its analysis. I think he's an excellent writer and I think because he's kind of in some ways convincingly in my mind bucking the trend of how it is that we understand what neoliberalism is, it leads to some really fruitful points for investigation and for thought. And so I've just been really taken by his work lately, and I just kind of wanted to share it, um, let people know about it so that they can go find him if they're interested in these kinds of things. And like I said, he's got a big book that he just did maybe last year that's called Globalists. And it's I, I don't remember what the subtitle is, but it's all about uh, like the rise, if you will, of neoliberalism. And it's uh, not just in America. Like some people want to just focus on America or they want to focus on like German order liberalism. He's kind of looking at uh, the entirety of Western Europe and uh, I think even beyond. Uh, so, and obviously the United States. But so I think uh, that his work is really valuable and I would recommend it to people. Are you familiar so are, with him? Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm not at all. Um, are neoliberalism's bastards then like Viktor Orban and people like that? The who's? Like Viktor Orban in Hungary? Like the, uh, um, the authoritarians? Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly right. Yeah, uh, the question is, is like, is there some sort of distinction between social conservatism and like this communitarianism, this civic virtue and free market capitalism? Because a lot of times they're viewed as being somewhat opposed to each other, right? And people are like, oh, but neoliberalism wants open borders. And there are actually some advocates, uh, even like Mises and Hayek themselves kind of changed their tune on the idea of open borders for labor, at least. Capital and knowledge and goods should be free to move for them, but not necessarily labor. And there's a reason for that because you can sort of like uh, discipline, if you will, disadvantaged populations and therefore retain wide margins in your profits by keeping their uh, wages low, right? So there is um, there are some differences here, and then there are some contemporary some contemporary kind of neoliberal theorists who are behind the uh, the German AFD party, which is now like the uh, the rival party in German Parliament, and. Um, and so he's kind of looking at where are these people coming from? Are they somehow opposed to free market capitalism and they're just all about like going back to mercantilism and like these protectionist policies and locking down the borders and like pure nationalism? Or is there still a sense in which they are eminently concerned with globalization and that, that even in this kind of desire for an ethno-national um, appeal that there's still a free market uh, and – a liberal market strategy that is wedded to that. And some people see that as a contradiction, and Slobodian does, uh, pays very careful attention to explain how it's not actually a contradiction. But they're just neoliberalism's bastard sons. They're still neoliberals, they're just a little bit different. You know? Yeah, I like that, that, that uh, metaphor of the bastard because the bastard is someone who's not fully legitimized, right, by the, mm. the like, original concept, but it still finds its genealogy in it. Yeah. Right. So it follows in sort of like a, a genealogical line from that. So that's an interesting metaphor. Yeah. And so, like, yeah, you know, I've been th we've been talking about this a lot recently. The the idea that the the new authoritarians, or at least um, proto authoritarians, or wannabe authoritarians, have a complicated relationship with things like the welfare state and 
and um, you know free market ideology and stuff like that. Um, we talked I think last week about how you know a big part of Trump's appeal was he came out and was able to say, unlike every other Republican, I'm all about Medicare and Social Security, right? <laughs> I'm not going to cut those things. Now that's different than the way he's actually acted as president, right? But that was a huge part of his appeal was that people believed that he was a new kind of Republican and that he was all about supporting um, those specific universal parts of the welfare state while, you know, getting on this sort of a nationalistic line on other issues like immigration. So mm. and I think, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but Marine Le Pen's had a pretty similar complicated relationship with the welfare state in France, right? Like she, I think she's promoted um, even increases to the welfare state yeah. than only for nationals, right? Along with the sort of nationalistic uh, um, immigration reforms and stuff like that, right? Yeah. I mean, we look at Marine Le Pen. Uh, you could even look at someone like Steve Bannon, who when he was the political strategist, they were talking about a $1 trillion infrastructure plan. So that would have increased budgets, increased government involvement. But at the same time, he's also talking about, you know, a sort of ethno-nationalist. He calls himself an economic nationalist. He wouldn't say ethno-nationalist, but he calls himself an economic nationalist, even though he, he means European culture, which means white people, right? Um but so there is this interesting contradiction. And I, and I actually, when I was reading this article in particular, I was really struck with thinking about my time in England during the time when Labour had just lost and the coalition government, which was led by David Cameron, uh, took power. And there was a movement within the Tory party at the time uh, called Red Toryism. Do you remember that, Troy? Yeah, I do. And I was very struck by that as being something that was very similar because there were appeals to civic virtue and communitarianism, but at the same time, they were still radically neoliberal. They were still radically uh, driven by the private interests of capital rather than like shifting to some sort of state ownership or government or uh, of like popular ownership or public ownership or cooperative ownership they didn't give a shit about stakeholders rights it was still shareholders are dominating so the logic of neoliberalism was there but it was couched within but we need to have families so not like the thatcherism where there there is no society this is the big society is what they called it so it was a really interesting morphing of third way blairitism into and it was almost seemed like a seamless transition which makes me think that that there is some sort of bastardization that's going on here or as a slobodian says he says that these things are emerging within neoliberalism not in opposition to it right and i think that's what people need to understand is that there's something flexible about this regime of management that is molding because because it isn't just some sort of monolithic thing. There are various like subdivisions within this larger abstraction that we call neoliberalism. And so I've been thinking a lot about what we're seeing with this rise of authoritarian neoliberalism, how it kind of is just the – it is the broad-scale legitimation and maybe even um, the culmination of that kind of red Toryist. It's about civic virtue. It's about the family. It's about you know your local community. Um, and it's all wrapped up in that language, but at the same time, it's still about – you know, the international division of labor and international supply chains and things like that. So there are these interesting contradictions that you find in this term. Yeah, and that's not a new thing, you know. I mean, I don't want to go all argumentum ad Hitlerum here, but just to make a <laughs> comparison, you know, the Nazis literally called themselves the National Socialist Party, right? But right. then they oversaw like the greatest transfer from public ownership to privatization in like the history of Europe, I think, or something like that, at least in Germany. Um, so you see this like veneer of uh, community and society and um, you know a sort of a social organism, but then behind it, it's just mass privatization, the logic of of you know, traditional liberalism. So um, that's that that at least that part of it is not a new thing, and I'm not it's definitely not being used in the same way, obviously by uh, Western European and American um, conservatives. But that it's not like it's a brand new thing to introduce that stuff. I mean, like the origin of traditional conservatism and like Burke has a strong element of um, these kind of more moral and communitarian aspects even before, you know, the free market is supposed to sort of serve those things in mm. the sort of abstract sense. Um, and uh, it's only maybe recently that those things kind of got switched and becomes a priority. Mm. You know, there's it's another logical, logical priority. Right. 
Right, exactly. Logical priority. Um, there's another book to, that I want to recommend now. It's uh, You just reminded me of. It's by a woman named Melinda Cooper who wrote a book called Family Values, I think is what the book is called. But if you Google Melinda Cooper and I think Family Values, you should find it. But she kind of traces this tendency back to the English poor laws that um, are actually, I guess, written in some ways into a lot of current legislation in the Anglo world. And so, but one of the things is that the English poor laws required you to, if you were a poor person, you went to your family. You had to go to your family first. Um, and if you couldn't, then the state would basically be like, cool, well, now you're in our, you're, you're in our debt and you can be an indentured servant sort of thing, right? But it really focused on that idea that you have to rely on the family. You can't rely on the state in any way. And so there's this like civic virtuism, this family virtuism that seems to really kind of be a consistency. And it's just found different ways to connect itself through the various different historical uh, regimes of governmentality. So another interesting book to consider. Yeah, totally. Thanks for those recommendations. Sweet. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and end the episode there. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you to Kendall uh, for having a wonderful chat. Um, there will be a link to her where you can find her uh, website and then uh, her Insta in the show notes. Um, so make sure to follow her and check out her blogs and stuff like that. And uh, like I said, if you previously, like I said, if you are able to support us, if you find value in what we're doing, please do go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn and you can get access to bonus content. And don't forget to go onto iTunes and give us a five star rating and review. And if you want to drop a question in that review that we can answer in a couple of minutes, we will do that on air on the next episode. Yeah, um, I think that's pretty much it. Anything else we got to do? Just one more thing, bro. What's up? Das Vidani Americanski.